We're ready to turn our attention to proportion and measurement. In this lecture, we'll learn about the discoveries and methods that led to some of the radical changes in 15th century European art. These discoveries would spread over the globe and are still very much with us today. As I'd mentioned in the introductory lecture, human beings have been drawing for over 80,000 years. And there are beautiful examples from just about every place and period. But until the European Renaissance, no one had figured out how to create a convincing depiction of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional surface. Then, over a relatively short period of time, artists were able to make the move from works like this, circa 1325, to works like this by Leonardo in the early 1490s. All of a sudden, plates sat down on tables, tables receded into 3D space of the room, and the rooms themselves had depth. How'd this happen? Why, after 80,000 years, after hundreds of thousands of generations of no one being able to figure it out? Remember, learning to draw is all about learning to see. And there came along a number of people who were fascinated with, fascinated with figuring this out. And certain technologies were evolving too. And we'll learn how those innovations may have played a part as well. One of the first individuals involved was an Arab scholar, Ibn al-Haytam, popularly known as al-Hazen. In Europe, he was followed by Leon Battista Alberti, Luca Pacioli, Piero della Francesca, Filippo Brunelleschi, Leonardo da Vinci, and Albrecht Dürer. The latter were all interested in the intersection of optics, mathematics, and art, and they enlarged on Hazen's and each other's discoveries. A number of them published their own seminal works describing newfound systems, tools, and methods. Around 1490, Leonardo wrote down the following method for getting accurate proportions. Quote, have a piece of glass as large as half a royal folio paper and set this firmly in front of your eyes, that is, between your eye and the thing you want to draw. Then place yourself at about two-thirds of a braccio, that would be about 15 inches, quote again, from the glass, fixing your head with a machine in such a way that you cannot move it at all. He goes on to tell us to shut one eye and draw upon the glass what you see beyond it. He suggests transferring the drawing to paper and ends by writing, paint it if you like, using aerial perspective carefully. This is a drawing from one of Leonardo's notebooks of an artist using just such a clear plane device to make a drawing of a sphere. In another entry regarding using flat, glass-like surfaces, he writes, you should take the mirror as your master, because on its surface, objects have similarities to painting in many respects. Leonardo was a practical man. How do you get it right? Well, trace or reflect the 3D world onto a 2D surface. That goes a long way towards solving the central problem of understanding the way three dimensions should appear on a flat surface. The glass or mirror translates 3D complexity into a visually understandable 2D version. Then you just copy the tracing or reflection onto your paper or canvas. Now, I mentioned the role of evolving technologies. It may well have been the availability of affordable plate glass, both in transparent and mirrored form, that opened people's eyes to what had been going on, well, right in front of their eyes for so many millennia. In his book, Daily Life in the Middle Ages, Paul B. Newman writes, by the 15th century, and that's what we're talking about here, the 1400s, while less prosperous people continued to make do with cloth, many could afford glass window panes. So, this may have been the signal technological development that enabled human beings to make the enormous leap into naturalistic representation, seeing things clearly on a transparent or reflective flat surface. Albrecht Dürer, who many of you may know from his iconic drawing of praying hands, also wrote a remarkable and very technical book on drawing. Part one was published in 1525, followed by part two in 1538. It was titled Unterweisung der Messung, or Instruction in Measurement. Dürer offers the same advice as Leonardo. Place a clean, flat plane of glass into a quadrangular frame. Now draw whatever you wish. It goes on longer than that, but that's the gist. Draw on the glass. And Thomas Aikens suggests the same method in his 1880s drawing manual. Given Leonardo's, Dürer's, and Aikens' endorsements, try it now. Use a black or other dark felt tip pen to draw with, and it's easiest to do this on a window in your home or office. 
but you want to make a small test first so you can clean it up after it without too much trouble. Choose a window that has something interesting going on outside, something challenging to draw. For instance, looking out at the backyard, you might see a table and chairs, or out front, a car in the driveway or on the street. Maybe a neighboring home with a complex pitched roof. That would be especially interesting if you're able to look down at it from above. If you're in an apartment or office, you may see other buildings, a street and sidewalks, and parked vehicles. All of these situations will contain examples of foreshortened planes, precisely the things people had real difficulty with before the Renaissance. The procedure is simple enough, though it takes a bit of getting used to. You have to close one eye. You also have to stay still. You can't move right or left. Maintain a constant distance from the glass. Start by choosing one thing to draw, a table, a chair, a car, a truck, and work out from that one object. Following Leonardo's suggestions, you'll find that you're able to draw proportionally. So go ahead, try it now. If you've just done your glass drawing, you're probably seeing the world a bit differently as a result. It's not that after this discovery, everyone drew on glass, but the procedure enabled people to understand how to translate three dimensions into, into two. Arthur Guptill offers a nice variation on this in his book, Rendering in Pencil. He suggests placing a piece of glass on top of a sheet of white paper. Then draw what you're looking at on the glass. When you think you're done, close one eye and raise the glass up before you. He writes, when, when the glass has been shifted to just the right position, the lines of the drawing should co coincide with those of the object. If they don't, you know your proportions are off. The glass, the glass makes the specifics obvious and you can correct. There's a key concept behind all this. Drawing on the window is in drawing parlance, drawing on the picture plane. Here's an illustration by Aikens that he made for his book. It depicts the picture plane. The early pioneers of optics theorized that when we see an object, what we're actually seeing are reflected light rays converging towards our eye. And we should note that these methods depend on a single eye. Remember, Leonardo instructs us to close one eye. This is monocular seeing and drawing. If we introduce a transparent plane between the object and our eye, we'll note the convergence of the rays on that plane, and we call that plane the picture plane. You likely noticed when drawing on the window that the drawings are much smaller than the objects themselves. You may have also noticed that the closer your eye was to the picture plane, the smaller the object appeared on the glass the farther, the larger. All of this is evidence of converging rays. Here's an illustration from Durer's second volume of his book, Instruction and Measurement. He writes, there is yet another method of copying an object, and it is more practical than using a glass plane. Durer's talking about a device called the velo, or veil. It was described a century earlier by the Renaissance polymath, Leon Battista Alberti, in his 1435 book, Di Pictura, on painting. Alberti wrote, attention should be devoted to circumscription, that means outlining. And to do this well, I believe nothing more convenient can be found than the velo. It is a veil divided up by threads into as many parallel square sections as you like and stretched on a frame. I set this up between the eye and the object to be represented so that the visual pyramid, that would be those converging light rays we saw in the Aikens illustration, so that the visual pyramid passes through the velo. In Durer's woodcut, we actually have two picture planes. The vertical one, that's the one where we can study what we see, and a second one, the sheet of paper, that's where we transcribe what we see. To this day, artists refer to the piece of paper they draw on, or the canvas they paint on, as the picture plane. There are a number of important things to note in the woodcut. The grids on the paper and velo are identical. Anything seen through the velo can be transcribed to the page by noting X and Y coordinates. Leonardo's advice for drawing on the glass applies here too. Keep one eye shut, always the same one. The tall object, like a statuette of the Washington Monument, lets the artist know where his eye should be. For accurate and coordinated proportions, the eye must remain in the same fixed position. Here's Aikens on the negative effects of moving. If he moved his head upwards, the tracing would go down too low. If downwards, the tracing would go too high. If he stepped back, his tracing would be too small. 
If he went forwards, his tracing would be too large. Returning to Dürer's woodcut, a couple other things to note. The artist's eye is coincident with the horizon in the landscape, and that coincidence is no coincidence. That's because the horizon is not a location in nature, it's a function of eye level. Next time you're looking out at a landscape, a flat landscape, or at the ocean, test this out. Take a pencil and place it horizontally level in line with your eyes. You'll note that the horizon is coincident with your pencil. Bend your knees so that you're lower down and repeat, or climb up on top of something. The horizon's always right there at eye level. And this is a notion we'll come back to when we study linear perspective, which was, not coincidentally, being codified by many of these same Renaissance individuals we've been discussing. Let's take a look at the model in Durer's woodcut. For most of history, people drew things in their iconic positions. That's the position where the silhouette of the object would tell us what it is. Men dancing, for instance. This also happens to be the position where the long axis of the subject is perpendicular or parallel to the ground. Think a person or bottle upright, perpendicular to the ground, or laying down horizontally, parallel to the ground. By and large, people avoided other views of objects for about, oh, 80,000 years. This accounts for the mashed up anatomy in the Greek dancers, heads in profile facing left, arms and upper torso straight on, pelvis and legs, profile right. And earlier, Egyptian figures are famous for this. The seated figure's head, that would be Horus, is in profile. Well, that's the iconic view for a bird's head. The shoulders, chest, and abdomen are depicted frontally, iconic view for a human torso. The bent legs, once again, profile, iconic view. Now, I love both these works, but artists at this point in time had limited options. Why? Well, if I ask you to draw my arm held out like this laterally, not too hard. But if I put my arm in this position, it's a lot trickier. It's the same with the bird head or bent legs. Not too, draw, not too hard to draw in profile, but a real challenge if seen frontally. So much so that I know of no good pre-Renaissance example of a limb depicted projecting out towards a picture plane. As some of you have no doubt guessed, we call this type of position a foreshortened one because the limb appears shorter in this view. While we're seeing the woman in profile, the artist is seeing her in an extremely foreshortened position, one where her distinctive human silhouette is all but lost. Alberti and Durer tell us how to tackle these difficult problems. Measure, find grid coordinates, note where and in which grid unit on the vertical picture plane all the important points are located, then mark these same points on the second picture plane, the page. Measure carefully and plot enough coordinates, and you get a rather sophisticated connect the dots drawing. Artfully connect the dots, and you get a proportionate foreshortened figure. Remember Dürer's book title, Unterwesang der Messung, Instruction in Measurement, and it was this fixation with measurement that fundamentally changed drawing. As you'll soon learn, the velo is but one of a number of tools we can bring to bear to solve problems of proportion and measure, but it's a really good one to start with. The essential idea behind using the velo is the same as tracing on glass or studying a mirror. The 3D world viewed on a vertical plane, here the gridded picture plane, looks flat. That makes it parsable. With the velo, we have the added aid of XY coordinates. We don't even have to worry about drawing a complicated object, at least not at first. We just have to place coordinates. Over the centuries, this tool has been used by many artists and students. Van Gogh went to great expense to make just such a device for himself. Here's his sketch, which he included in an August 1882 letter to his brother Theo. He wrote, I've just come back from the blacksmith who has put iron spikes on the legs and iron corners on the frame. It consists of two legs. The frame is fixed to them by means of strong wooden pegs. The result is that on the beach or in a meadow or a field, you have a view as if through a window. Note the extra holes in the frame. You see, he could string it up as in his sketch using the diagonals and cross, a simple armature, like the ones used to practice Chinese characters, or he could string it as a grid, like Durer. He goes on to tell his brother that the frame and lines provide a clear guide so that one can make a drawing setting out the broad outlines and proportions. How delightful it is to train this viewfinder on the sea, on the green fields, or in the winter on snow-covered land. 
With considerable and lengthy practice, it enables one to draw at lightning speed. The frame has become an excellent piece of equipment. It has cost me a pretty penny, too. There's no turning back now. He signs off, adieu, old chap. So we're in good company here, following in the footsteps of Alberti, Leonardo, Durer, Aikens, and Van Gogh. A great first project using the Velo is to draw a deep foreshortened space, something like a hallway. Here are a couple examples from my students at the University of Washington, and I'd like you to try this too. We'll be calling on many of the things we've already studied and adding new procedures. We're really building in complexity now. You'll use a range of pencils and line weights. Use lighter pencils for construction lines, darker pencils for the drawing itself. You'll use four types of line, gesture line, construction line, contour, and cross contour. You'll use gestural compositional sketches to identify a strong composition. You'll need to think about the drawing's rectangle, its format shape, and its armature, as well as object ground relations. You'll scale up from perceived size to a larger dimension and retain proportionate relations. Then use grid coordinates to lay out accurate proportions and use negative shapes as a further aid toward this goal. You'll build your drawing moving from large visual events to greater detail. The first thing to do is to find a hallway or deep room. You want to look down your hallway through your viewfinder and frame it so you see five large planes, a back wall, the two side walls, the ceiling, and the floor. As some of you may have guessed, the viewfinder we've been using is a picture plane. Here's the question. How many points or coordinates do you need to draw these five planes? As you may have guessed, the answer is eight. Four coordinates for the corners of the back wall, and another four where the diagonals projecting from the back wall meet the viewfinder. Find eight coordinates, connect the dots, and you'll have drawn the wall, ceiling, and floor, a strong proportionate beginning for your drawing. A general premise is to find the places where edges intersect in the viewfinder. Place these points on the page. This will create the connect the dots underpinning for a proportionate drawing. These intersection points are the places where one direction meets another. This could be in the subject I'm drawing. It could also be where an edge in the subject encounters an edge on the viewfinder. A second premise is to work from the large to the small, from the general to the specific. And that can be challenging. It's really common for beginners to only see the nameable objects. Some people want to stop, start with a clock on the wall or a door or a chair, and they totally ignore the large planes. Draw the large planes first the walls, ceiling, and floor. They'll be the largest shapes in your drawing. You want to think in architectural order. Before you hang a clock or install a door, you have to build the wall. Before you put a chair in a room, you have to build the floor it sits on. So, find a hallway, or really any room. The deeper, the better. Find one that's not too complicated. You don't want a highly ornamented interior or one that's cluttered with furniture for this, for this project. The drawing's all about determining accurate proportions and measurements. We don't need any value, shading, or hatching. They'll all get in the way. Line alone is fine. We're going to proceed in three distinct steps. First, make three compositional gesture studies. Next, scale up from the best study to your 18 by 24 inch paper. We'll do this because our velo, our viewfinder and grid, is smaller than the drawing we're making. The third step's making the drawing itself. Let's go through each of these steps in detail. You'll need pencils, erasers, and sharpeners, a pen or brush and ink, viewfinders, clips, masking tape, and the clear acetate grid. You'll also need a ruler, T-square, and drawing board, a couple sheets of smaller paper for gestural compositional sketches, and one sheet of 18 by 24 inch paper for the final drawing. The first steps to identify a strong composition. Make several quick gestural compositional sketches on smaller paper. Like Rembrandt, draw directly with brush and ink. Using ink means you can't erase and make a finished little drawing. The idea is to quickly give yourself several compositional options. Now, at first, these drawings may not be very proportionate, but they'll help you to begin to see and understand what's before you. As you repeat this process over the coming months, you'll find that you'll consi consistently improve. Throw yourself into it, there's nothing to fear. 
I'm asking you to do three distinctly different studies, each from a different point of view, each using a different format shape. The large drawings are going to take some time, so you want to try to find a promising point of view and framing before committing. Walk through the room or hallway looking and framing with your viewfinder. Don't worry about the grid yet, we'll get to that later. Make sure you can see the five major planes, back wall, two side walls, the ceiling and the floor. Make sure you have enough of each. If any of your planes are severely cropped, it will make the space feel less three-dimensional. Try different rectangular shapes using your viewfinder. And a heads up, if you stick to quarter, half, and inch increments in the viewfinder's opening, it will simplify the math when scaling up. As you try different format shapes, note how the large internal divisions relate. Think about the armature and composition. When you found a pro promising point of view and framing, clip the viewfinder together and you're ready to make your first gesture study. With a harder pencil uh, with an H of some kind, lightly trace the shape of the viewfinder in the center of the page. If your format shape's horizontal, turn your page horizontally. If vertical, vertically. Remember, you always want to keep that same eye closed, keep your head in the same position, hold the viewfinder at a consistent height and distance from your eye. Holding it at arm's length is a very good way to go. Now, with pen or brush, make a quick gestural study. Call on the exercises we did using gestural line. Push yourself to draw quickly and in an all-encompassing way. Establish the major compositional relationships between the format shape and the large planes. Walls, floors, and ceilings. Next, attend to the large events on those planes. Windows, doors, furniture, etc. These objects are figures on grounds. As your brush darts across the surface, be attentive to the positive and negative shapes. The negatives measure the distances between the positives. Work quickly, you're drawing with gesture line. These drawings really shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes. If you don't like a drawing, try it again. Nothing to worry about, it's a couple minutes, cheap ink and paper. If you're attentive to what you're looking at, you'll see and understand more with each repetition. The little drawings are going to improve. Once you've made at least three gestural studies from three different points of view, take a look at them and select the best one. This act of selection or curation is an essential part of learning to draw. As you practice doing this and work with the results, this skill is going to improve too. The next step is to measure your study, then scale it to the 18 by 24 inch paper. For example, this study is 4 by 5 and 3 quarter inches. The smaller dimension 4 will fit into the smaller dimension of our paper, 18, four times, giving us 16 inches. Next, we'd multiply the larger dimension, 5 and 3 quarters, by the same factor, 4, to get to 23. The scaled up rectangle would be 16 by 23. If the larger dimension turns out to be larger than 24 inches, start by dividing 24 by the larger dimension. Once you've calculated the rectangle's dimensions, lay out the format shape lightly with a well-sharpened H pencil, ruler, and T-square. It's a good idea to get into the habit of centering the format shape in the page. This way you have maximum flexibility to open up the drawing on the right or the left or the top or the bottom if you need to. So the first thing we want to do is just uh, take the viewfinder apart and then check the calibration on the viewfinder against the grid to make sure that everything will line up. And you'll do that with the other arm as well. If anything doesn't line up, it means you have to check uh, how you've drawn your inches or how you did your grid. Next, once we've done that, we can just turn this over and we'll line up our grid with the viewfinder itself. And then we'll just take a piece of tape or two and secure this in place. With that done, we'll just put our other arm of our viewfinder back in place. Clip it together. Might want to add an extra piece of tape. And we're ready to go. 
The next step is to draw a scaled up grid on your large paper. The acetate grid is one inch by one inch. To draw a corresponding grid on your page, you'll scale that measure by the same factor you use to scale the format's dimensions. In the example, we multiplied the format's measure by a factor of four. So we do the same with the grid unit. Since the, since the acetate grids one by one, the grid on the page will be four by four. Along the borders of the format shape on the 18 by 24 inch paper, mark off the grid unit's measure with small marks. Connect the marks with horizontal and vertical lines to create the grid. These are construction lines, best if they're light, thin, and precise. Now, like the artist in the Durer, you have a gridded velo to look through, and you have a proportionate gridded horizontal picture plane to draw on. You're ready to make your drawing. First, put away the small gesture drawing. It served its purpose. You'll be looking directly at your observational source, the room. Also, put away the rulers and T-square. Draw freehand. Take out a well-sharpened F, H, B, or B pencil to begin the drawing. As before, keep one eye closed, your head held in a fixed position, and the viewfinder at arm's length. Find the eight coordinates that will give you the five big planes, back wall, floor, walls, and ceiling. Identify where each coordinate is on the velo and transpose that position to the page. Make a very small light dot at each coordinate's location. The larger the dot, the less precise. When you've placed these eight coordinates, connect each set of points with a single line. Call on those line connecting exercises you've been doing. We're drawing for proportion and measure, so you don't want to make a lot of sketchy lines. They won't define a measure. Instead, they'll suggest a range of possibilities. In this drawing, the goal's specificity. Durer can guide us here. This drawing concerns itself with human proportions. He uses a very specific line, not a sketchy or gestural line. The goal of the drawing is to establish clear and accurate proportions. Gestural lines don't achieve that. So, locate your eight points and draw your lines to create your major planes. Now, take a look at your shapes. Eyeball them. Does the back wall you've drawn resemble the back wall you're looking at? Does it have the same ratio of height to width? Do the other major planes look about right? If not, erase, take another look at the coordinates, and redraw. Earlier I'd said that the goal is to move from the large to the small, from the general to the specific. In the art building at the University of Washington, once we have our five major planes, we generally move on to the aggregate shape of the light fixtures. All we need are four points or coordinates accurately placed, and then we can draw the light fixture's aggregate shape. Then, the negative shapes between them. This will define the fixtures themselves. For each negative shape, we need four points. Eyeball your shapes. Compare them with what you see. If they're off, erase and remeasure. Then, we go to the aggregate shapes of the cork boards. Then, the aggregate shape of the recycling bins. Then I asked my students to eyeball and check. Next, we might locate the moldings and doorways. Last, we move to the smallest visual events. Find their coordinates in the velo, transpose them to the paper's surface. Your own drawing will no doubt be somewhat different. The essential thing is to follow this procedure. Remember, you're not drawing things, you're establishing coordinates, then connecting those coordinates using clear lines. As you draw, don't forget to consider line weight. Varying the line will help create the sensation of receding space. It will also create focal areas and focal points. Use a range of line from dark to light, thick to thin, and continuous to discontinuous. Using a range of pencils is really going to help, and be attentive to managing your pencil's point. Next, we'll continue our discussion of proportion. You've already learned about seven tools that help us get things right. We'll add another six. Soon, you'll have a professional repertoire of techniques to bring to bear on complex drawing problems.